So thank you for joining. We're, we're now live on um, Latera TV uh, with our, our popular segment, uh, Fringe Legal Edge. Um, there might be a slight difference to regular uh, viewers. Um, I'm standing in for uh, the local host or the regular host, Ab. Um, but I am joined with a fantastic uh, guest today, Alice Namuli Blazovic. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, who uh, I know we've got 30 minutes and I think just um, sort of talking about your experience and your expertise might actually just take up that 30 minutes. So I'll try and uh, summarize it uh, as best as I can. Um, uh, simply put, um, Alice is an award winning lawyer, international speaker and author. Uh, with over 16 years experience specializing in technology uh, and the, the law within that um, surrounding cryptocurrencies, working with some of the largest fintechs and blockchain technology based businesses. Um, but equally, um, has a huge voice in the legal technology space, um, being an influencer and innovator and founder of several different legal technology innovation hubs um, in Uganda and, and, and Africa, it seems. And, um, I, I'd be lying if I'd, I said I didn't um, do a bit of research and saw that you were also nominated as um, one of the uh, ILTA's um, influencers of the year, female influencers of the year. So congratulations for that award. Thank you. Um, did I miss anything, Alice? I'm sure I missed something. No, that's uh, enough, that's enough, no worries. <laughs> brilliant. Um, well, thanks again for, for joining um, me today. Um, and on Latira TV, um, you know, when I, when I uh, first reached out, the thing obviously coming from Latira being a legal technology provider was your, your role and how your legal experience um, has sort of merged into your presence within the legal technology space. Um, and I'd love to just hear from you how, first off, you got into the legal um, industry um, and how that eventually merged into your interest into uh, legal technology. Well, um, I guess a bit of, just a bit of background from my profile. Um, yeah, my background is in project finance, uh, PPPs, mergers and acquisitions, private equity. But then uh, for the last um, eight years, I slowly gradually um, went into uh, technology and innovation. And right now I'm over specializing, I would say, in um, helping businesses or advising businesses that um, use uh, blockchain or blockchain-based businesses and, and AI. Um, but also the specialization just pretty much also came in um, uh, gradually or slowly. And my interest mainly was more of um, when I got to learn about, um, that was 10 years ago, just trying to understand the kind of wave that was uh, coming for the legal profession, mm -hmm. um, the kind of technologies, emerging technologies that uh, won the market. To me, it was very uh, uh, kind of interesting trying to understand the impact on, of technology on the legal profession. So mm -hmm. I just kept on reading so much about these technologies and I, I got quite interested in uh, specifically artificial intelligence and blockchain. Mm. And I guess, yeah, the, the rest is history. Then, um, of course, when you, when you end up, I took a couple of trainings, um, online trainings on blockchain and AI, and also got into different spaces where, of course, these conversations were going on. At that time, I was a leader in law society, you know, mm -hmm. as a association. So, of course, as a leader, definitely you have to help with uh, uh, shaping the future of the legal profession and it combined in the work I do with the legal innovation hub and also the spaces that I got myself into and trying also to understand the clients which mm. we call now the new clients who are <clears throat> using these technologies but very few lawyers were able to understand them so to me I pretty much just got in at a very early stage to help um, these clients yeah Brilliant. And, yep. No, that's amazing. Can you tell us a bit more about the Legal Innovation Hub um, and what its goal is? Um, I noticed it was around nurturing young technologies and, and individuals and entrepreneurs interested in innovation and technology. And I'm wondering how that sort of came about and how, um, you know, any any sort of 
anecdotal results you've seen from it that sort of make you motivated to, to, to carry on pursuing it? Okay, again, there are two hearts from it. One was, um, as a, again, I was a leader then in a, a law society, but also I run a, a platform for mentoring young lawyers. It's called Coffee with Alice. I don't know if you saw that. I did, year. yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, basically a program to mentor young lawyers uh, to help them bridge that gap between the theory they, they, of course, they study in school and legal practice. Um, I just realized, uh, of course, as a leader, that so many young people were struggling just to understand what exactly, um, what they can do to actually be successful in their careers. And the missing link was usually the soft skills. Um, so through, um, after so many interactions with these young people, I realized they, they lacked or they wanted to gain so many skills to help them with, uh, um, to survive in the, of course, um, the 21st century mm. but unfortunately very few law schools or actually none at that time in, in in uganda or even africa on the continent offered them that opportunity to be able to be creative and innovative or to even give them space to learn about um these subjects or new technologies it was more of old school um law you study law mm. and then leave but then the challenge was that they would leave school and struggle to cope up in a world where we're using a lot of technology, uh, not, not only in law firms, but also um, our clients. So to me, I just said, I kept on thinking, what can I do? How can I create a platform for them actually where they can be able to create and innovate? And, but yeah. um, that had been tied in from also the kind of frustrations that I, reali I realized from so many legal innovators who had who had um, come up with so many legal tech products on the market, but very few lawyers um, appreciated them or adopted them or were willing to embrace them. And th there was basically like a, some kind of, I would say, friction because these innovators kept on you know, innovating and coming up with mm. amazing products, but law firms were not will they're not willing to give them a, a try. Yeah, what I was just trying to uh, sort of understand is how you create that voice and influence in a law firm um, to try and drive technology adoption where there is perhaps a bit of resistance. So the resistance was more mainly because um, I think lawyers were very comfortable in their space, were just didn't want anything to do with uh, so much change, you know, that had just been brought about by these emerging technologies, and they're just not willing to, 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 to change the way they were doing things. But um, that was, a, I should say, before COVID. Post, mm. Of course, post COVID, <laughs> now they're willing, so many lawyers are now willing to listen to, uh, or to try to understand what uh, legal technology is all about. Um, and they're willing to actually either buy these uh, legal tech products that are already on the market or to use that, try train their lawyers. So mm. I find that now they're more receptive, of course, because COVID forced everyone to uh, adopt or to, to work in a totally different way. So I guess that was the good side to it. But before mm. COVID, it was yeah quite difficult and it, it was more of a comfort. But mm. anyway, now to, to loop it in with the legal, tech, uh, the legal innovation hub, it's also into fold. So how do you bring technologists who are innovating for the law and then um, matching them with uh, lawyers who are creative and innovative? Most of the legal tech products we, I, re I realized that were on the market had been uh, created by technologists who had not who were not able to appreciate the law. Um, but then when you, in the Legal Innovation Hub, when we put teams together, as in technologists and the um, innovators who are, have a legal background, we find that so many of the, the products then were being able to, I guess, make connect with most lawyers. So for me, basically put, setting up the Legal Innovation Hub was to, to bridge that gap, uh, bringing technologists and uh, lawyers in the same space to innovate for the law. Yeah. Mm. And as a very good breeding ground or training ground for young lawyers um, in innovation and um, technology. Absolutely. And, you know, 
combination of the legal innovation hub of what you just mentioned there and um, coffee with Alice, where you're mentoring young lawyers, you know, teaching them various different soft skills, but also introducing them to some of the technology side of things so that it's an easy transition. Are, are you, is, is it at a point yet where technology in a law firm is a unique selling point or differentiator to um, attract or retain young talent within the industry do you do you see that being a, a trajectory down the line where you know younger lawyers coming in <clears throat> obviously used to technology or, or you know have technology constantly around them where that'll be a driving force to retain good talent once they start developing a certain skill set that makes them attractive to keep in the firm oh yes definitely um what you have to understand right now, law firms are, um, have uh, very senior lawyers who really are not willing to <laughs> to change their change. ways. Don't even. worry, you don't have to name names. <laughs> um, and then there's, of course, the you know mid-senior who are like, okay, what's going on? What's there? And... And now the very young ones, the millennials, who are like very mm. hyper, they want to use all these technologies, but they've also been introduced to these technologies before they've joined law firms. So they, they need that technology to be able to actually be productive. And remember, now most of the millennials or younger people, younger lawyers, their world is all virtual, right? Mm. So because they've been, uh, the way they do things, the way they communicate, the way they behave, the way they relate, everything is virtual and digital. So if you said put them in a law firm where they are not able to use much technology in, in, in their day-to-day -day lives when they're delivering legal services, it becomes, a, it becomes difficult. So what does that mean? That if a law firm is not using the, I guess, latest technologies, you're going to, it's going to be very difficult for you to retain good talent. Yeah. Many young lawyers will definitely go to those law firms where they're able to, uh, I guess, uh, use most recent or modern yeah, yeah, technologies. So it's, it's definitely having a very big impact on, mm. on retention yeah, of good talent. And I suppose you could expand, I'd love to get your personal experiences if you've ever encountered this, especially the fact that you work with technology businesses, people who develop technology and are no strangers to technology. Um, mm. the, the demand from clients has heightened over the years as well. Um, the expectation that their law firms should be more efficient, productive, and as cost effective and time effective as possible. Um, from your from your experience, are you, are you seeing that as being instances where you it's the difference between winning a client, losing a client, um, and has that created more urgency to adopt technology in 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 law firms, uh, in whether yeah. in Uganda or from your experience globally? Yeah, de uh, de de definitely. Like I told you um, earlier, for me, my what really attracted me to um, um, technology, tech, and innovation was more of I just realized there was a new client where who very few lawyers were able to understand or relate with, and that was the client who was using um, blockchain technology and AI in their business, day-to-day -day mm. business, but very few lawyers were able to, you know, advise them. So you'll find, like I said, right now, there's a very, very big uh, boost, uh, growth of e-commerce on the continent because of mm. even just the growth of the internet uh, on the African continent. So, so many things definitely, uh, transactions are being done online. Um, even very simple things from um, like, uh, E electronic signatures, like every whatever is being used uh, in, in most businesses. So if you're the, a lawyer or a law firm that does not understand that new client, that the client that uses technology on a day-to-day -day basis or whose transaction is from A to Z, then it becomes very difficult for you actually mm. to um, deliver legal services to this type to this type of client. And even that the client themselves, when they are choosing a lawyer, that definitely has to play in. So many now banks, um, they want to uh, connect with uh, fintechs, like mm -hmm. fintech, fintechs. So if you're a lawyer and you've been a banking lawyer and now you don't understand that kind, that kind of technology that uh, uh, definitely connects uh, mainstream financial institutions and these fintechs, 
um, then they, there's, a, there's a problem there. They will, that means that bank will need to appoint a lawyer who understands um, that uh, technology aspect of, of the transaction. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, there is, it's the, uh, the new, the, 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 the clients who are, have, have, have embraced technology and are using technology on a day-to-day -day basis mm. um, are choosing or are looking for lawyers who are able to understand them or speak the same language. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm originally from South Africa, so I always have a keen interest in sort of how things move in South Africa and Africa as a whole. And one thing you find with industry is it is incredibly fast paced. There is opportunity to innovate and to move things to market very quickly, as you mentioned, e-commerce um, as an example. Um, so, you know, the professional services and, and law firms falling into that category need to need to be expressed or show some sort of agility to, to move with their clients and to be able to accommodate um, their, their clients as well. That's really interesting. And, um, and you, you mentioned one of the good, and we've, we've seen this with our, with our clients and just the global trends. One of the good things, if we can say that from the COVID pandemic is the acceleration in technology adoption out of a necessity. Um, do, 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 are you concerned with that being a sort of short term solution, you know, if things start getting a bit better, um, will things start going back to normal? Will people revert back to their old ways? And what are some of the initiatives that you perhaps are taking to make sure that any change is for the long term and not just a short term resolution? Well, um, well, you said you're from South Africa, so you you had a lockdown, right? Mm -hmm. In a, yeah. yeah, you experienced that. Um, but what we, we've been having a lockdown for some time, and gradually, the, um, the, the restrictions are easing. Been, restrictions, yeah, are easing. So, but what we realized is that people were very quick to adapt to, you know, the new, the new normal, which is like, let me say, using as much technology as possible. Um, mm. Uh, using, uh, depending more on like online uh, execution of uh, documents. But then after lockdown, everyone is like, okay, we can go back. Some people rather are now willing to go back to their old ways. But unfortunately, mm. that it's, not, it's not about lawyers to decide now which, um, how to operate. It's about the client determining how they would want to relate with you as a lawyer. So mm. it's, it's not the game actually changed. It had been slowly changing because it's, it, um, when we left law school, it was more of lawyers, this is how we practice law, this is how we do things, you mm. go with our way, right? But now the clients are definitely determining how we, 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 we practice. Yeah. And if a, a client wants to carry out the transactions or have uh, meetings online, or uh, prefers mediations online right now, where there's a, um, a mediation um, or an out, an out of court settlement I'm helping mm. with some clients. And it's all on Zoom there in South Africa, in uh, Dubai. And we, we, we're here in Uganda, we just uh, go live and they're mm. able to actually participate. So what I'm trying to say is that what other clients Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about the barking. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is that what are the clients saying? What are the clients saying about yeah. um uh there's definitely a problem. And this is the Hello? this is the beauty of live television. <laughs> yes, I can hear you, Alice. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Without, I can hear you. You were yeah, you were you were you were talking about sort of that's the you know the 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 shift is the shift has changed. It's the clients now sort of leading the charge and kind of if they want to carry out a meeting online, the law firms need to ultimately sort of service that request. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, you, you know, because I know that there are concerns with long-term adoption, but I would imagine you just mentioned that they're speaking to someone in South Africa, Dubai, Uganda, you know, beforehand, how would that have to be carried out? Would that just be, you know, would you physically go, you know, do a mediation in, in person? Yeah. Because then there's a time, yeah. there's a time loss to that, the time you lose flying to go to a location. So I'd imagine that there would be some efficiencies like that, that the lawyers would prefer. Yeah. Well, um, we didn't know better, I guess. That's what I should say. Yeah. That, and that's how we, the thing was that everyone had to fly in and you had to wait for, um, if you had to wait for, uh, like for example, court proceedings that mm. the judge had to, you know, to be there, the, all the witnesses. But now everyone has to just can call in from wherever they are, and you need to go with the uh, proceedings or a trial or anything. So, but right now, what I'm, I'm saying is that if if the clients are, have moved on, and when I also say they've moved on, is that so many clients have moved from brick and mortar, from the way they are doing things. Like for example, if you, you used to represent like a, a construction company, which used mm. to use a brick and mortar, right? To, mm -hmm. Now, if you're using, a, you have, you're representing a construction company that is using 3D printing, you must be able to definitely understand what 3D printing is. Mm. You must be able to relate and speak, you know, that language because the client has moved, the client has changed. You, you used to mm. talk about uh, clients that are using fuel, you know, gas, oil, and everything. Now we are talking about clients using electric cars, you understand? Mm. So all these things have to, uh, you must be able as, as as lawyer to speak the language of, yeah. of, that, of that client. We have no option to go back to the way we use mm. things. That's a really good way of putting it because you are, yes, you're an not, extension, not extension, you're an extension of your client. So, you know, your understanding and knowledge yeah. of what they do and what they're looking to achieve needs to sort of match their, their kind of passion and interest in that as well. That's a really good way of putting it. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I suppose, you know, it's it, like you, you mentioned the courts there, um, you know, you see around the world, they're having to do a lot of their court hearings over Zoom. There's been some sort of you know, um, monumental first times you see in sort of Singapore or Mala um, and Malaysia, them carrying out, you know, very high, <laughs> you know, high profile cases over Zoom, which kind of looks bizarre from the outside looking in. So I can imagine, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't ever a necessity to do that. And therefore the law didn't dictate it. And therefore the law, for the lawyers didn't have to do things in that way. So it's amazing how quickly, and it's unfortunate that something like this had to happen to accelerate it, but it's great to see you know, how we adapt and how we change certain circumstances and nothing is permanent. And there's always yeah. room for things to evolve yeah. and for yeah. things to change. And there'll yeah. be things that probably worked, you know, like I could, I remember at the beginning of lockdown, everyone was doing Zoom calls, you know, with all your friends and you're doing all of that. And that novelty very quickly <laughs> wears off. So there'll be, you know, I and know. you adapt <laughs> and you adapt and you change the way you do it. So it's, it's, you know, it'll be interesting to see this time next year, hopefully we're, as a, in the world, we're in a much better place, but it'll be interesting to see what's stuck around, what hasn't, what lessons we've learned and how it will drive the legal industry forward. Do you have any projections, you know, especially being in blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which there's probably a projection every 10 seconds. <laughs> so do you have any projections as to that industry or how the legal sector will look um, in, in the short um, to long term? I think the projections definitely have, have always been there because for me, I started out definitely as a tech enthusiast and then mm. I ended up being like a fully uh, practicing lawyer into tech and innovation. And at that time to me as trying to be a futurist was like, oh my goodness, there's something coming. I would try to talk out to, to the lawyers about it, but no one was, no, very few people were listening apart from the very, very young ones, by the way. Mm. Uh, lawyers above like the age of 35, 40, no, no yeah. one wants to listen. But then, like I said, when we, of course, when COVID arrived, mm -hmm. uh, people are now willing to listen. So this, the projections were always, the legal um, industry is going to change in the next 10 to 20 years. But then after COVID, it, everything turned around. So many of my mm -hmm. colleagues abroad or people we work with 
uh, from a, uh, I mean, globally, they are still working from home. Do yeah. you understand? So I, I think everything has changed. It's just that very few people are willing to uh, actually um, appreciate uh, that change. So going forward, post COVID, I don't know, because we're in post COVID, but we are still like, you know, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, dealing with that, with, with the impact or the consequences. What I definitely think is that every, we are going to use more um, of uh, technology in, in legal practice because uh, the client, like I said, the client would not be able to understand anything different because if there is technology that is very quick, that would help or enhance the way we deliver legal services and a client knows about it, then it, it wouldn't make sense for you as a lawyer to come in with you know the old ways and insist we mm. should do things in a certain way. Like I'll give you a very short example. Uh, when I started legal practice 16 years ago, you used to have like very lengthy legal opinions on uh, likelihood of success over 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 matter. So okay. you'd get, yeah, you'd get paid like you'd write like I don't know five pages, 20 pages about you know, likelihood of success. Now there's a technology which can be able to give you a more accurate answer in a split second on the likelihood of success over over of your case because mm. it will be able to access um, precedents from all over the world, from all over within Uganda, if the case is in Uganda. Um, it will give you uh, different, you know, judgments or reviews mm. from different judges who have decided like this, and the possibility of uh, this particular a particular court deciding in a certain way. So if a client knows about this technology, then mm. they won't they won't they would expect you as a lawyer to use it. So if you don't yeah. use it, then yeah, you won't be you won't be speaking actually the same language. So yeah. I definitely think that we are not going back we are already in the future this is the future there's no we are leaving it um the impact is already here and the question now would be those who are willing to move with the times or hang in with the yeah. old times and yeah yeah and it's and like everything it's um it's a transition right um and i think um whenever you hear the word ai uh, you know, you immediately think uh, some something's going to come to take away from me, take away my job, take away the work. But it's not. It's a it's a it's a facilitator. It's there to yeah. enhance your work. It yeah. it's there to eliminate the administrative yeah. tasks or the yeah. the the heavy lifting, so that you can focus as much of your time benefiting the client and outputting yeah. for the client. And I yeah. think that that's a mind, mindset that when lawyers and law firms identify that and see how that can help, adoption yeah. is, is pretty organic at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I agree 100%. That's very Fantastic. True. So we well, don't have to, have to worry about I was no. just trying to affirm what you're saying. Yes. Affirm what you're saying. We don't have to worry about uh, these technologies taking away our jobs and all that because there's much more we can definitely do when we use uh, this technology or embrace the technologies. Absolutely. It's to work with us, not against us. Right. And that, yeah. uh, that sounds like what you're trying to achieve through um, the different organizations you work with at, at, you know, at its core, really trying to change that mindset in the, the younger generations and throughout the legal industry. So that's very impressive, Alice. And um, you know, I, I hope we can keep in touch and uh, you know, um, yeah. I will, I will keep on refreshing Google because I'm sure every, every day there'll be something new that you've set up or some new article that you've posted and I eagerly await to, uh, to read and follow that. Um, uh, and unfortunately, you know, we're, we're, we're at time now. If you, if you had any closing remarks, Alice, um, then yeah, it'll be great to hear. Well, I think uh, my closing remarks would be definitely um, when it comes to legal take or is, okay, I say legal practice, the it's important to focus on the young generation to be to train them to give them a space to innovate and and create and also to encourage as many um, young lawyers to um to to train or to upskill those who have have left uh, law school they can upskill because there's so much opportunities now to train online you mm. can go online and get any 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 training whether it's coding for lawyers, whether it's blockchain for lawyers, there's so much, you know, you can learn, mm. learn and upskill. But also our, our, our law schools now, 
um, they definitely have to uh, adapt or change like their syllabuses or modify mm. them in a, some way to be able to uh, train and um, skill the young people, the young generation uh, they are training right now. And somehow at least give, give them some skills that will help them to survive um, in the future mm. or, in, or in the present now, it's no longer the future. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's all I would say. Um, law yeah. firms um, investing in training their young lawyers um, and uh, upscaling, giving them opportunities to create and innovate, setting up some kind of hubs within uh, their law yeah. firms so that these, these young lawyers are able to relate with the new clients, the new client who is all, you know, tech and yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. There's a there's a saying um, that I really like. It's um, you know, what if we train this person and they leave, and then the other person says, well, what if we don't train them and they stay? You know, exactly. so um, yeah, I completely yeah. agree. You have to invest. You have to invest into people. Um, yeah. You know, um, to to obviously get the, the the best out of them and allow them to grow and and sort of create sort of well rounded um, experiences and expertise. Yeah. And it's, um, it, 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 it's great to hear, Alice, that you're very much a, a, a part of that and influencing that um, in Uganda. And it sounds like, um, you know, globally now that there's no real barriers to um, how you can learn and where you can learn. So of course. Um, no, that's, that's brilliant. So the trainings now we have, we have a, a, an academy that is strictly for, for training young uh, talent. On the continent, on the yeah, all over wow. the continent, not only Uganda. Yeah, that's amazing. No, Alice, um, I, 30, 30 minutes is, is too short. I could sit here for, <laughs> for a lot longer than that and speak with you, but um, I believe we have another session coming up after this. So, um, you know, it's been it's been amazing speaking to you. Of course, let's let's Thank certainly you. keep in touch. Um, yeah. Best of luck with everything, and you know, Thank stay you. safe. I hope hope you and the family are, are healthy and, and doing well during this uncertain time. But as you say, it sounds like we're all, we're all in, you know, we all adapt and uh, hopefully we'll come out of this stronger. Sure. Thank you so, very much, Michael. Definitely. No worries. Keep it Absolutely. Okay. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great weekend, Alice. I know it's late there. It's uh, like 7.30. <laughs> hey. Yes, yes. What time is it on your side? It's uh, 5.30 in, in the UK. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you need it now. You need to turn off and enjoy your weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Great, Alice. Bye. Thank you very much. Speak soon. Bye.